If you, like many of us, happen to have an, at the very least, cursory interest in fighting games, you're probably quite familiar with a recurring and somewhat cookie-cutter approach to series protagonists. I mean, just consider your standard Ryu. A character that undoubtedly has a certain appeal to him, but from a design standpoint, he's also undeniably very middle of the road. The stoic karate man that offers you a comforting and warm embrace as you dive deeper into the game in order to wean you into the game systems. A jack of all trades that doesn't necessarily excel at any one thing, but tends to lack nothing. All this generally presented in a mechanically undaunting way as related to the overall game system. This approach to fighting game protagonists is one that is almost ubiquitous in the genre. Sure, your protagonist might sometimes be presented as less serious, more badass, more of an edgelord, or even more of an edgelord. Generally speaking though, this expression comes as a companion to their franchise's aesthetics. If the rest of the cast is made up of characters from metal album covers, well, the game's version of Ryu will be trending toward that themselves. If you happen to pick up an iteration of the Tekken series, however, you will surely be struck by how Bamco's flagship breaks this pattern in almost every single conceivable way. The characters that Tekken pushes forward as its protagonists and slaps on the box art don't seem to follow this oft-recurring approach. Kazuya is in most ways very much the opposite of Ryu. Their basis in Karate Man is perhaps worth a mention, but while Ryu presents a stoic, noble demeanor, Kazuya is portrayed as an egotistical sociopath seeking ultimate power. Where Ryu narratively struggles with not giving in to the easy road, Kazuya eagerly accepted said deal pretty much from the inception of his character. Unlike other edgier approaches to the fighting game protagonists, like Saul or Ragna, Kazuya doesn't hail from a roster of horrible people. Tekken as a series has plenty of morally good characters, Kazuya just happens to not be one of them. The aesthetic and narrative choices made with Kazuya would be enough to set him apart from the mold, but the differences do not end there. While Ryu, Saul, Ragna and Terry were designed as easy to approach all-rounders, an intro to their larger game systems, Kazuya happens to be one of the more technical fighting game characters to ever be created. Certainly among the recurring characters at least. Designed with most of the tools one could ever want, but having many of them being locked behind intense execution requirements. At this point, I'd like to make a note of the fact that Ryu, Saul and the rest of their ilk are in most of their game systems ranked among the most picked characters, often by quite a large margin. To me, this makes a lot of sense. They are not only where the game tends to rest its cursor when you boot it up, they also happen to be on the box and are quite easy to pick up and play. On the flip side, overtly technical and mechanically complex characters tend to fall on the bottom end of pick rates. Having made note of how Kazuya is separate from the generally utilized fighting game protagonist mold and how technical characters tend to fall to the wayside, you might find it interesting that Kazuya and the rest of the Mishimas consistently rank among the most selected and well-liked characters in the series. Now, perhaps putting the character's face on the box is enough to force this phenomena into effect, but perhaps there is more to it. Let's take a bit of a dive into the history of these characters and attempt to find the reason for their lasting popularity. Before we dive headfirst into the timeline of the Mishimas, Perhaps it is best if I explain what the hell a Mishima even is. Nominally, the Mishimas are all characters from the same bloodline, namely the Mishima one. 
However, the denotation more specifically tends to relate to three recurring characters in the Tekken series. Kazuya, Heihachi, and Devil Jin, and the playstyle their shared toolkit promotes. A toolkit that historically includes, but is not limited to, the Flash Punch and Demon Slayer combos, the Tsunami Kicks, Hell Sweep, Dragon Uppercut, and of course the iconic Electric Wind Godfist. The Electric, as it is generally shortened to, is an extremely quick high launching attack that leads to advantageous situations on both hit and guard, and acts as a linchpin for the overall Mishima strategy. Along with the Electric, the Mishimas all share a highly versatile movement option in Crouch Dash, a trait which allows them to rapidly advance across the arena and take control of screen space. With practice, it is possible for the Mishimas to execute almost the entirety of their moveset from a Crouch Dash, which lets them apply mix-ups at will and lends them a huge advantage in punishing their opponents. The Crouch Dash and the Electric both come with a rather large impairment for the player attempting to pilot the Mishimas, however. While both are extremely strong options, the techniques demand strenuous execution to be successfully integrated into match play. The Electric requiring a just frame input to execute while not allowing any of the four or sometimes three inputs to be buffered at all and correct application of crouch dash, be that wave dash speed or executing while standing moves instantaneously, leads many strong players to consider the Mishimas inconsistent results wise. Jumping into Tekken 7, a quick look over of Kasuya and Hihachi illustrates their core but simple playstyles. At the lower end of the skill spectrum, Kazuya intimidates with his easily available 50-50 mix-up options through Hell Sweep, Right Split Kicks and Twin Pistons, all to coax the opponent into overextending into his really strong counter-hit moves. Heihachi on the other hand, utilizes his incredible array of strong mid-launchers and delayable strings to bully his opponents into submission. As the skill level of the player increases, so does their access to incredible punishment options for both guarded and whiffed moves, making the Mishimas incredibly hard to not overextend against. To fully understand how the Mishimas fit into the history of Tekken, we ought to contrast them with another recurring character. In this case, I've opted to highlight series regular Paul Phoenix, seeing as he currently represents the most selected character in Tekken 7, and has never missed an appearance in any iteration. In Tekken 7, Paul is without a doubt a powerhouse. In fact, I'd go as far as describe most available attack options the character has access to as bona fide power moves. From his incredibly strong punishment options like Shio and Double Axe Swing, onto strings like Phoenix Bonebreaker and the Rapid Fire series all the way down to damaging 50-50s with Demolition Man and Death Fist. An oft-repeated opinion is that Tekken 7 Paul is superbly well designed specifically because whatever you end up pressing, well, it's probably gonna be both fun and rewarding. At higher levels of play, Paul turns into a defensive juggernaut, with strong combo options that offer superb damage, great keep out tools like Kawarogoma, topping his arsenal out with strong counter hit tools at any hit level. So let's dive into how these characters have changed over the years, getting our baseline with the evolution of Paul Phoenix all the way back to 1994's Tekken. Tekken 1 Paul is probably best described as economy class. Functional, but very Spartan. This first outing of the character does contain some of his signatures, like the Death Fist, Hammer Punch combo, and the Bone Breaker, uh, the prototype version of the Demolition Man, if you will. Beyond that, however, it's pretty hard to find much of the shared DNA between this Paul and his current iteration. Nevertheless, on a grander conceptual stage, Tekken 1 Paul still very much hits like Paul. Then again, most characters in the game do. 
all of this is very understandable. Tekken not only faced the difficult prospect of being the first of its series and a super early 3D fighting game, getting any new character nailed down mechanically and aesthetically on the first go can be very difficult. Come Tekken 2, the design team took a similarly frugal approach to bolting new stuff onto the character. Allowing Paul to execute Bonebreaker from Hammer Punch and giving him two new additions that were fated to stay for a very long time. Flash Elbow and the Jawbreaker series. These somewhat slight changes might seem a bit cut rate, but they do end up making the character feel a lot more fleshed out. This along with overall system changes, like reduced damage and combo potential, impact Paul a lot in terms of strategy, forcing him to make more use of the moves he did possess. But hey, at least Trooper Roll knocks down crouching opponents now. All in all, pretty impressive considering Tekken 2 released less than a year after the first game. The year 1997 brought the first real additions to Paul's move list in Tekken 3. Most notably, a new stance in Backsway, executed by a quarter circle back motion. This would come to be a mainstay in Paul's game plan for all future iterations of the character, and the moves introduced would change very little moving forward. Rubber Band Attack and God Hammer Punch representing scary mid options, with the Rapid Fire series granting Paul a delayable low starting string to pressure his opponents with. Befitting Paul's character, all of these new options were also devastating on counter hit. On top of his new stance, Paul was also granted the overhead punch aptly titled Hammer of the Gods, which would remain a strong way to initiate offense for the character moving forward, and a strong one hit with Punisher in a thruster. Rounding out these non-stance tied moves was Shoulder Tackle, one of many to come, a move with some built-in evasion. It should be noted that even with these new additions, Paul's strategy didn't change a whole lot compared to Tekken 2. But considering Tekken 3 introduced an entirely new dimension to the gameplay, players probably already had their hands full mastering other aspects of the game system. Just two years later, in 1999, or three if you were playing on a PS2, Namco released the first Tekken All-Star game in Tekken Tag Tournament. In most ways, really just a beefed up Tekken 3 with a tag team function. It being extremely similar mechanically to its predecessor didn't stop the Tekken team from granting the returning roster some new goodies to play with. And this rang true for Paul as well giving him a niche but useful move in turn thruster, but perhaps of more note, introducing mainstay low attack, pump in pedal. Executed from sidestep, this low gave Paul another avenue to ship away at opponents who refused to duck without opting for the way riskier options like rapid fire and bone breaker. Tekken Tag Tournament was the last of an era of completely open staged and extremely spacing heavy games for the series and come 2001, everything was about to get a whole lot more reined in. Tekken 4 marked the second large evolution of most of the cast, and this included Paul. For one, he gained a slew of new moves, most of which will be intensely familiar to any Paul player. Moves like Shoulder Smash, lending Paul a strong and quick mid-punisher that doubled as an evasive gamble tool. Burning Spear, a high backswing blow type move. And finally, the boot. An advancing mid-kick that was largely useless because of its terrible frame data. Of more particular note were the two introduced Just Train moves. A high follow-up to Flash Elbow, turning this pretty middling advancing attack into a powerhouse of a move, and of course, the ever iconic Demolition Man. Yes, this is the first time Paul had access to Demo Man. Pretty crazy to think that it took Namco a whole five games to introduce this move that most of us vividly relate to Paul as a character. 
It's interesting to imagine what people considered the quintessential Paul experience prior to Tekken 4. Unlike in Tekken 7, Demolition Man requires two time just frame inputs to execute. A strong mix up tool since its inception, but not as much of a combo option. Notably for Tekken 4 only, Paul can execute the full Demolition Man from a hammer punch starter, something removed from all following games. Along with new moves, Tekken 4 also introduced new mechanics, walls easily being the most notable one. This practically ends up changing the strength and usefulness of certain moves, like drastically increasing the stopping power of the Death Fist at certain positions. In reality, however, the game's wall system was incredibly flawed, which sort of ends up spoiling this aspect quite a bit. Still, unlike earlier games, if you squint a bit, you can start to see the outline of a modern Paul Phoenix all the way back in 2001. In the minds of most players, Tekken 5 represents a major departure from the systems established in Tekken 4. This is half true. In a lot of ways, the game cast off the more radical changes brought on by the earlier game to return to a playstyle incorporated back in Tekken 3. The walls, though, were definitely here to stay. Tekken 5 is generally seen as the standpoint where the series began calcifying into its modern version. With that somewhat grandiose description out of the way, it might come as a surprise to you that Paul actually changed surprisingly little. In terms of additions to his moveset, especially ones with much of an impact, there are quite few to discuss. Tekken 5 marked the first game that allowed Paul to execute the launching low sweep jawbreaker independently from its string, a move that would come to change quite a bit moving forward. Wrecking Ball, a move most viewers will recognize as a homing attack, acted singularly as a slow counter hit tool, this seeing as homing moves were yet to actually be invented. Rounding out these two quite slight additions was Body Blow, Paul's downfoot one, gaining the added ability of being cancelable into his back sway stance. Imagine that. Paul players had to wait a whopping seven years between the introduction of the stance and them gaining the first possible entry into it from a move. The expansion to Tekken 5 Dark Resurrection brought three additions rounding out his Tekken 5 moveset, with Lion's Roar, a mid-high follow-up to Body Blow, Tan Yoda, a short-lived slow shoulder attack with a sabaki punch parry window, and lastly, Lights Out, a quick high knee, went from a counter hit to a normal hit launch, lending Paul some extra punishment tools. As with earlier titles, the leisurely paced but iterative process employed by Namco had trickled new moves into Paul's game plan some of them majorly impacting his playstyle, and others not as much. The next installment in the series, however, was about to majorly shake things up. Tekken 6 brought along a slew of new moves and updated attack properties to a large amount of the series roster. To cover every single addition would be somewhat superfluous, so we'll stick to the ones of note. With the introduction of Bound, a combo extension stake, came Double Strike, which doubled <laughs> as a strong 12 frame punisher. Alongside the Bound mechanic, several new moves substantially beefed up Paul's combo game, like Piston Fire and Oha, both lending Paul significantly increased stopping power and ease of use. Gengetsu, an advancing low, Mountain Race, a safe but very damaging mid, and the revamped low launcher in Goomba together solidified Paul's roll dash as a stance no longer relegated to simply housing Death Fist. Granted, Thruster did lose its incredible counter hit potential, but Paul made up for that in a lot of other ways. Perhaps in particular in how Backsway as a stance was reworked. Both God Hammer Punch and Rubber Band Attack becoming knockdown attacks on normal hit 
and the Rapid Fire series gaining a new, higher launching animation, lending itself well to the increased wall combo potential that Tekken 6 had introduced. Switching our focus to Tag 2, a game that acted as a sort of Tekken 6 plus tag game, saw characters generally not changing that much compared to their Tekken 6 counterparts. Paul's overall moveset remained mostly the same in this title, but his few additions were quite noteworthy. The Baxway stands finally gained one of his most signature Tekken 7 moves, the homing, advantageous on guard, insane counter hit launcher Kawarogoma. Baxway also saw the addition of Higaku, a mid tag bufferable launcher, which mostly saw use in back turn combo situations. Rounding out his Tag 2 appearance as well as his punishment game was Shio, a mid to high knee string with crushing damage potential for its speed and befitting of a Paul move, incredible counter hit potential on the second and delayable hit. So we've just spent a whole lot of time going over a character that is definitely not a Mishima. What gives? The idea here was to illustrate how the evolution of most of Tekken's cast has occurred. It being a slow, iterative process where the identity of the character emerges over a long period of time. If you're familiar with Paul in pretty much any iteration of Tekken, going back just one game will almost assuredly leave you feeling a bit puzzled. The character has in every iteration slowly gained moves that will feel indispensable to players of that particular game. And this isn't only true for Paul, it is true for the vast majority of characters to ever grace multiple entries in the series. It's pretty uncontroversial to say that Tekken 6 tends to generally mark the spot where the bulk of the cast start feeling somewhat like themselves. And with that out of the way, Let's take a peek at how the Mishima's changed over the years. Oh, so they they've had everything since day one? Like everything? Hell sweep? Flash punch? Tsunami kicks? Dragon uppercut? Demon Slayer? Twin pistons? Left split kicks? Right split kicks? Twin god fist? Now, I'm only half serious, of course. The Mishimas, like the other characters, have definitely received updates throughout the years. For one, it took Namco until Tekken 3 to turn the Wind God Fist from a mid to a high with a just frame variant. But it is no joke that the characters had been comparatively feature complete for decades when the rest of the cast started to actually get fleshed out for real. Even taking a look at somewhat fringe moves from the Mishima arsenal highlights the same sort of disparity. At what point do you think Heihachi got access to the flying mid-low kick mix-up from Crouch Dash? Tekken 5? No? What about Tekken 4? Or Tag? No. He already had it in the first game. The same goes for Hell Axel, Demon Uppercut, and any number of other moves. There have of course been additions that similarly to the rest of the roster feel vital to their current game plan. Kazuya didn't gain his counter hitting down for 2, abolishing fist, until Tekken Tag, and Heihachi's quick iron fist didn't expand his selection of while standing moves all the way till Tekken 6. Even so, the attacks that you do see fill out the Mishima's move list over the years are pretty slight and generally not strictly necessary for them to feel like distinct and solid options. Something that becomes readily apparent when you realize the Mishima's have almost as an afterthought gained and then lost about the same amount of tertiary moves as the rest of the roster have gained absolutely vital ones. You don't believe me? Do you remember this move? What about this one? No? This one then? What about this absolute banger? Or this? Or that? How about this one? Or that one? You remember this? Do 
do you miss this move? What about that? In contrast, Paul has had a total of one move be entirely redacted and replaced over his entire lifespan. What I'm trying to get across is that Mishimas have pretty much always been fully formed since day one. Seeing the stark contrast between these characters, a theory might start to formulate inside one's brain. It seems pretty plausible to me that a large part of the historically high pick rate of the Mishimas is at least in part because of their high degree of completeness. Paul represents the route the design team took with the majority of the Tekken roster, small incremental changes honed in an iterative way over several games. Opting to pick a Mishima because they gave you a more fleshed out experience in comparison seems entirely reasonable. It should definitely be noted at this point that there have been several characters in Tekken's lifespan that have had larger and more unique movesets than Paul. But I think these characters, whilst definitely intriguing in their own right, have toolkits that lack the clarity of purpose of the Mishimas. In a lot of ways, the Mishima design is actually comparable to Street Fighter's Ryu, in terms of impact on their game series. Namco, by happenstance, just ended up grafting it onto a very mechanically complex set of inputs. Touching on that complexity again, Mishimas are complex, yes, but they are complex in a very clear-cut and obvious manner. Something I think grants them a very keen edge in the war for popularity. I'll put it like this. Watching a Mishima being played well is almost objectively fun and exciting. Unlike a lot of complex fighting game characters, it is very easy to grasp when someone is executing mechanically impressive and focus intensive strategies. Consider the electric and the wave dash again. Movements that come with very clear visual and at times audio cues. And now contrast that with other very skillful mechanical displays within fighting games. What part of this eddy combo shows great skill? Where should you share? during this Ibuki combo. Having clearly defined points of execution is great for spectators, and spectating something cool almost inevitably sparks interest. I believe this is a recurring element in what people consider the hypest mechanical aspects of fighting games, like Evo Moment 37 or watching high-level spaces in Melee and Mishimas have this in spades. There are certainly more factors at play that factor into the Mishimas popularity. For one, the characters have a somewhat insane track record for overall character strength within the series. Most Tekken characters have at some point or another been at the top of the pecking order. But the Mishimas as top tier threats is an almost ubiquitous factor across Tekken's history. Most characters, when averaged out tier wise across their many appearances in the series, end up with a somewhat middling score. Note, this score does not represent their percentile strength comparative to a roster, but their average placement within a tiered system, between 3.15 and 3.5 being an oft recurring placement. The Mishimas, however, all average out at over 4+, plus, with Devil Jin easily leading the pack at a whopping 4.58, only rivaled by Steve, who has basically been tied for best character in every single one of his appearances. This next statement is probably going to shock exactly zero of you. But people like winning and they like playing strong characters that help them feel powerful and achieve that goal. Character strength also impacts the beginner and the spectator. When we see extremely strong players duke it out in tournament finals, a lot of us tend to get inspired. And a non-zero percentage of those inspired will flow directly into trying to emulate the play of the top contenders. Character pick and all. 
So we've taken a stroll through the history of the series and consider the Mishimas from a couple of different aspects. Not only have they been on the cover of the box since the series inception, they've been fun and strong and great for skill expression for several decades now. No wonder they never get picked last. Thank you.